Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 19 of Project Odyssey. We're here in orbit with a very special payload that is getting ready to head over to the moon. But first, I have some news. About 15 minutes ago, I was down at the launch pad, and it looked like this. What happened to my ground textures? Why are they all black? Why is the VAB black? Well, the problem here is Project Odyssey was built in a 0 3.5 version of KSP, and it's a pain in the butt to upgrade this because of how I've customized it. So I'm still running in 23.5. However, I ran out of memory. So I downloaded a 64-bit Unity player and hacked together my 23.5 install to actually run in 64-bit to open up additional memory space, but all of the textures have gotten kind of funky looking as a result. What I probably need to do is just accept it. I'm going to have to try to figure out how to get myself on 024.2. Can't say I'm very excited about that idea though. Look at this mod list that I'm going to have to upgrade to 242. I already have issues with my current install. Take a look at the engines. Look at the flames coming out of the bottom there. This is a new engine out of the brand new KW rocketry, but there are these gigantic gaps between the flame particles coming out of that engine. That might have something to do with the engine. It might have something to do with the hot rockets mod. I don't know, but it's just something I need to look into. So if I'm doing that and I'm upgrading to 242, there's just a lot to do just to maintain this current install. First, what I want to do is take you to the tracking station, give you a quick rundown of what's going on because I think I have a lot of birds in the air right now, and a little look over there might help people understand what's going on in all the different missions at the moment. Mission number one, the primary objective is to get home. And to get home, what we have built here is Odyssey Station as well as some communication satellites that will communicate locally and with Duna, like here and here and here. We also have some satellites that are on their way to Duna. That's what all of these are here and here and here and here. They're all heading to Duna for different missions. Well, actually, no, wait. These two here and here are not headed to Duna. They're going to provide communications to Duna. These three over over here are headed to Duna. One of them is a local network, one of them is a high altitude network, and one of them is a Cathane scanner to look for where we want to land when we finally go there. Our second mission is to gather Cathane, and that's what we're doing right here. We just launched the Cathane lander, and pretty soon I'll be heading over to the moon with it. For that purpose, over here at the moon, we have a couple communication satellites pointing at both sides of the moon to provide complete coverage there, as well as a Cathane scanner that has determined where we're going to land. And this moon refueling vessel, which we're going to fill up and send back, proving that this is actually a viable strategy. Lastly, we have the Save Hadfield, and for that we have the Minmus Traveler that is currently orbiting around Minmus, generating that medicine that Hadfield needs right now. Also, we're sending a mission to Joule for the permanent cure, and that means we need this Molnia Orbit high altitude satellite that will provide communications to Joule, as well as these two satellites here and here that are both going to Joule in order to grab atmosphere and bring it back to Kerbin. So back here at the beginning of this episode, you saw this vessel launching, but it was a little bit different because what you were actually seeing was my simulation. I did it with the interface off to make it look kind of cool and be able to put that little video at the beginning of this, but it wasn't the real thing. What I found were a few little things I wanted to change, like adding an extra booster to it to make sure that I got into a proper orbit. And there are some changes inside on the lander itself as well. Anyway, this this is the official launch, and now we are fast forwarding ahead into it so that we can get to the good part where we're going to bring up an additional launch to dock the transfer stage to this that'll send it on its way over to the moon. This is our first actual reference mission that we're doing at the moon that one day we'll be doing at Duna with probably the exact same lander. One difference between the two is that it actually might be easier to land at Duna than it's going to be to land at the moon because this is built with parachutes. 
on top of that lander that will help slow it down. I'm not going to be able to, to deploy them when we go to the moon, of course. No air. It's kind of a problem when you don't have air for your parachutes. I suppose technically I wasn't really going to rely on the parachutes that much to slow down when it really comes down to it. For the most part, the parachutes are going to be to help assist with the deployment by making the fairing come off because we'll be using the fairing to go through the atmosphere. At the moon, once again, we'll just be releasing the fairing and just letting it float away. Now this launch is the transfer stage and if anybody out there is thinking, gee, this is starting to sound an awful lot like the Copernicus missions, well that's because that's what Project Odyssey is sort of loosely based on. It'll look a lot like the real Copernicus, except done in KSP with Duna. It'll look strikingly like another video that's been out for a very long time of a Copernicus mission that was just fantastic if you ask me, but I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to go with a whole bunch more landers and satellites and all kinds of stuff that I can do down on the ground with everything on a bigger is better sort of scale. All right, well, clearly the deployment of the fairing here could have been done a lot better than that. It didn't seem to really pop away very much, and uh, actually, I probably should have released it in this particular case while we were still accelerating, but I had kind of forgotten about it, and I didn't do it until the very end. Nonetheless, no damage done, so here we are looking out at the orbit. Right ahead there, you can see that that ship in front of us is the actual lander stage itself. We're trying to meet up with that. We're probably going to go about one third of the way around Kerbin before we actually meet up, but it won't be that far. This is my first time launching this particular one, so it took a little getting used to here. Obviously, it'll get better as time goes by. We'll work on perfecting the different lifters as well as these transfer stage launches and meeting up and docking hopefully quicker than it is going to be this time because there are going to be quite a few missions that are going to use this style of launch something really heavy and then launch a transfer stage to it and dock it up and use that to get where we need to go, whether that be Moon or Duna or whatever. Okay, how close did we get? Where is it? Ooh! Geez, we're really up close on this thing. I was out at the mini-map there, well, the main map, watching the orbit, watching myself get closer on that, and just kind of powering up or using RCS or whatever it took to watching my close approach distance until I was close enough. And when we popped in, all of a sudden there we were like 40 meters away. That's not too bad. All right, once we dock this up, is actually the first time that I'm going to get a chance to look at the Delta V that's going to be in this entire thing because I was sort of just doing the math and taking guesses. I didn't really figure out exactly what I was going to have. Uh, hopefully it's going to be close enough that we can get ourselves to the moon and stop once we're there as well. The lander will be able to power itself down to the surface. This transfer stage will just get us there and slow us down. Is this thing gorgeous or what? And boom, there it is. We just docked it up. Oh, look at the beauty of that thing. And there's where we're going. We're heading to you, man. So far, so good. The only glitch I've had is right before the launch you just saw, I made an attempt at the same launch, but I got crackened on the launch pad. Had to revert that and try again. The craft just hadn't settled down yet when I tried to fast forward in order to get the target ship to come overhead. And so instead of going into normal warp speed, it went into physical acceleration and shook itself apart right there. Well, the burn toward the moon has begun, and just as I'm beginning this, I'm being reminded, well, I'm just sort of remembering, not being reminded by anybody or anything in particular, but just sort of remembering that chances are a stage like this might be something like a cryogenic fuel, and technically I should be decoupling it after the burn, and that there should be some sort of propulsion on the actual payload that would help me capture an orbit. And it just so happens that I'm going to have to do something like that anyway, because right there, we were down to about 70 Delta V when that stage was finished, making its transfer to get us to the moon. 
70 wouldn't be enough to capture, so there's going to have to next time be something on the payload. This time, since technically we're not going to Duna, I'll just decouple the payload from the fairing, and we will go in on our own power from the lander. I'm pretty sure that I put enough on the lander all by itself, and we don't need the fairing anyway since there won't be any heat shield requirements for our slowdown at the moon. While I'm thinking about it, we'll come into the VAB and we'll make the modifications to that payload carrier, that delivery vehicle. This isn't the one, this is the transfer stage. But we'll make those changes to that so that next time they will be ready to carry our packages over to Duna. In this one, we can see that we have some brand new parts here. I've added a 5 meter inline avionics ring that gets used in the payload of this. I have this new thing over here, a rover body. You're going to see that soon. I welded that together. It has some gyroscopes and an avionics ring right in the middle there. Some large batteries. On the next tab over under propulsion in the bottom here, we have brand new parts. These are gigantic fuel tanks here and here as well as a new SRB, which you can see is on the side here, and this new five meter engine, which we're using on this stage right down there. So if we start pulling some of this stuff off and moving our way up the side, we can see that the lower stage is your basic sort of transfer stage, and then underneath the fairing, we have flipped upside down the actual transfer stage, which has a gigantic KW rocketry 3.75 meter docking fairing on it there, and some RCS both at the bottom, which is actually the top because it's upside down, and the top, which is the bottom. In order to give it enough power to make it to the thing that it's going to dock to, instead of putting solar panels, we just need to get to its target and dock with it. So there's just plenty of battery right here on the outside of it as well as of course some lights in there and these stackable inline lights like this one right here right underneath the avionics ring that has its communications on it right there we have that light this one can get pretty bright now technically what's going to happen is this thing is going to be flipped over once we decouple it and it's going to fly like that so I'll work my way from the bottom of this one. We have in here the normal engine that we would use for lifting regular payloads. So it's not very efficient, but it's a gigantic fuel tank up there. Although maybe I have some room for some more fuel because nothing in here is actually fuel. This whole section, I could probably turn that into some fuel. Now continuing down from the bottom, besides the more lights we have right there and our RCS jets. I have radially attached some mono tanks on the outside there, which are actually connected to more mono tanks on the inside right there. And this whole thing is actually just a decoupler that I'm not using as a decoupler. I'm just using it basically as a tapered adapter. And that's why I think I could turn this into fuel or put fuel up inside there at the very least. Inside here, there was one fuel line that would take that fuel down from up there, down into the engine. And beneath the tapered adapter, there's just the light stack, the fuel tanks, another light stack, and that's it. Now the Cathane Lander had the same sort of lower stage, except it had three solids on the bottom because it is such a heavy payload. Also, those solids were set to decouple one at a time. Only one of them would come off, and then the next, then the next. And I did that because the heat generated by the separation boosters was a little bit too much for the engine. During one test when I decoupled all three at the exact same time, the heat as they went by actually blew up the whole lower section in the engine. Decoupling them one at a time allowed me to avoid that problem. Now when that decoupled right there, that left us with this. You can see up inside there we have the docking ring embedded in the base of this decoupler. 
And attached in here, there are some solar panels that you can't actually see them until they are extending. And then they extend out through the side as if there were a door that opens up. At least in my mind, that's what happens. A little door opens up, and then those solar panels extend out to the two sides. Now this is the area where I think we need to make the modifications. We need to add some sort of engine in here, maybe some radially attached engine on the inside of this fairing with fuel that's also radially attached on the inside right in here perhaps. Either that or allow these docking rings because they're so gigantic and I'm not quite sure why they need to be that big. We could put some fuel inside the docking rings. Now as for the payload, you're going to have to wait to see that as we get to the moon. Have we restored communications with Eve yet? Finishing the algorithm now, sir, should be coming up any second. Tell me immediately when they are online. Igor, what's the status of the cloaking device? Test vehicles in orbit now, sir. Good, I want them ready to test in 30 seconds. Open a channel to the ship. This is Eagle Base to Raptor 1. Come in. This is Eagle Base to Raptor 1. Put this channel on the big screen once it's opened. This is Eagle Base to Raptor 1. Do you read? Raptor 1, we're ready to begin the preliminary cloaking test. Come in. This is Motherbird. We're reading you, Eagle Base. We have Raptor 1 on the scope. We're patching them in now. This is Raptor 1. We read you, Eagle Nest. We have Mother Bird in sight. We're deep in Eve's gravity well. We're ready to commence the cloaking test. Affirmative, Raptor 1. You are a go on the cloaking test. I repeat, you are a go. Commence the test. Affirmative, Eagle Nest. We're opening the bay doors now and charging up the wave emitters. Activating the last in five, four, three, two, one. Here we are back in our own dimension though, and our lander is very close to the moon now. We just need to intercept, and there we go. So now we'll make a slight adjustment, bring up that periapsis so we're not crashing into the planet. But first, we have to actually deploy because the engines, as we previously mentioned, are only on the lander at this point. I need to add some sort of propulsion to this stage so that when we get to Duna, we can actually capture at Duna with this still intact because this is going to act as our heat shield when we get there. For now though, we will just pop that open and the lander will fly right out of it here. The plan at this point is we're going to raise up that periapsis just a tiny bit to make sure that we're not crashing, then circularize. After that, we'll be looking for a place to land. We need to find a good cathane spot, something that'll pass underneath the orbit of the current refueling ship that we already have around the outside there of the moon. It would be a nice bonus if it were also a nice big fat cathane deposit so that we can stay there for a long time and collect as much as possible from that spot. So clearly step two then would be once we find that spot, we're actually going to do our landing. This is an unmanned launch at this point. There's a little bit that needs to be set up by hand. That's the actual plan at Duna as well, that this would kind of begin its deployment by putting out different bits and pieces that are required in order to make this 
whole refining, refueling station work, but then when the Kerbals actually get to Duna, that's when they're going to finish off the station, the base, and begin actually extracting the Kethane and refining it and making use of it in order to get home or to power their base. Well, there we go. We have circularized, more or less, and I've done a little scan on the outside to determine exactly where I want to go and where I want to land here. Somewhere that's a little bit equatorial would also be nice, and we have found one. The engines are running again as we bring down that orbit to just over the bottom edge of that large section of cathane right there. We're zipping across the surface because I need to get a little bit closer, bring out that landing gear, or landing skids I guess technically is what we could call them in this case, and checking the map I can see that I am still on course to land on that bottom edge. I'm not really sure what the stability of this is going to be yet, so the engines were only going there at about 10, 20%. Now we're powering up to 50, 60%. Waiting and checking the map there, waiting until we get a little bit closer to make sure that we don't overshoot it or undershoot it. Both of them would be bad. I think we're going to be pretty tight on fuel. I believe that we should be over the spot right now, so powering up 60 70 percent now it looks like we're probably looking for that landing spot just over the edge of this crater but i think there's another one coming up i think we're going to try to go right in between here so full power full power now we're going to try to come down on this nice flat area right here look at that we're going over a small crater and then there's a bigger one let's go right into this nice flat region right in here we're getting a really good view of the top of this vessel as we come in for our landing. You can see that there are some depressions on the front and the back. Each of those contains a couple little deployable lander things. You'll see what those are in just a little bit when the deployment rover comes out and starts putting them into position. Those are the meat and potatoes of this operation. We have a refinery, we have a drill, we have a power generator, and we have a very large battery to store power for when we go through the dark side, and that way we can still be running our drill even when it's dark. Oh my, that liquid fuel is running really tight. I'm using the RCS to help with the landing slow things down. Oh, look at the liquid fuel. Oh dear, oh dear. More RCS, keep it all burning. Almost there now, touching down in three, two, one, touchdown. And here's our beautiful lander, ready to do its job. We have a little bit to deploy, but we're almost there now. The folks back on Kerbin are super excited as long as we have landed in an iced cathane spot and oh my, we are right on the edge of that one. Look how close we are. Oh, look at that. We have our communications line heading up into the orbit there and bouncing the signal back into the geosynchronous orbits that then go down to mission control. One more thing to check, how juicy of a spot was it? Oh, over 400,000 cathane. Okay, time to deploy the deployment rover. You can see that we have a little rover body that earlier I showed is all welded together into one part to make it a little bit more stable for when it's picking things up. We have six wheels on there for more stability. The middle ones are locked, but the front and back can steer. And all of them, or maybe just the front and back, I can't remember now, have power. Now we'll flip this thing around here. It was docked inside that cargo bay. And I undocked it and then lowered it down, as you saw on that. We have an infernal robotics hinge that can lift up and bring this piston closer to the target. We also have Kerbal Attack attachment system to extend out with that winch and lower down that docking port which will not we don't want it too far away we'll bring that back up a little bit and then get closer to our target here so that we can actually get that attached to the side of the first piece that we are going to deploy and then we'll find out if this whole idea is going to work or not 
Since this is post-commentary, I have a sneaking suspicion I know whether this is going to work or not. But you'll find out in just about a minute. Right now, the docking port is wiggling its way into position, and it has finally locked. If you leave the docking port as part of the rover and not as a separate craft like it was right there, it actually messes up the infernal robotics hinges and so that's why I had to let it be loose. Also, the side benefit is I don't really have to worry quite as much about getting into the exact right position because the magnets on the docking ports pull those things together and make it quite simple for those to attach. Now you can see that I've detached that little lander piece and it's time to go and put out the legs on it and then lower it down to the surface. Once again, we'll be going to the Kerbal Attachment System winch and simply telling it to release, or we could lower it down a little bit. Also need to adjust the Infernal Robotics hinge to a 0.1 speed. That way it won't go down too fast. Before we actually put it down, I want to open up the legs on this thing. Wait, the legs? I can't interact with the legs. And there you have it. There's our problem. I didn't put an actual probe on the individual landers themselves, which means with remote tech running, I can't interact with them once I have them separated from my rover, and I can't dock them to the rover because then it would screw up the infernal robotics hinges. I can't even access the docking ports to decouple them, so it looks like for the time being, we are stuck just like this. What I'll need to do is send up an actual Kerbal. Svetlana was going to go here anyway in order to set this base up, finish the setup of this base. So Svetlana will just hop in a capsule and we'll send her to the moon. She'll land here and she'll fix the problem by bringing along some batteries, solar panels, probes, and we'll use Kerbal Attachment System to get them all attached to the appropriate bits and that will allow the completion of the deployment of the rover. And here goes Svetlana now. She's in the new five meter launcher. What? Uh, uh, what? Uh, okay, revert. So it looks like the crew manifest mod is interfering in my 64 bit version of KSP here. Have to revert, have to make sure that I have the right Kerbals inside without using crew manifest, or I can do a save and a reload and that clears up the texture problem as well. Alrighty, hiding away inside this nice big huge rocket with big huge fairing is Svetlana in a capsule as well as a lander. I have both of them under there. It's a little bit of an Apollo style launch. I was working on trying to get some parts to make it very Apollo style with the whole pedal opening top fairing sort of a deal, but the parts just were not cooperating very well, so instead I simply went with a fairing to cover up both. Once we get this into orbit and on the way, which if you will look at my flight computer window, you'll see we're actually heading straight there now. I haven't looked at the map yet. It's time to take a look, set the target, and see how we're doing. Uh, I'm going to have, I've run out of fuel, so I'm going to have to actually do the deployment and finish off the flight using the fuel from inside my Hydra 2 capsule, which you can see right there. There goes the fairing. Didn't really decouple very well. Eh, oh well. The capsule has now released its shroud, its escape system. Also decoupled away from the actual lander. Now we'll just set out all these solar panels, communications, that sort of a thing, and flip ourselves around so that we can dock to the lander after opening up its protected docking port. This lander should look fairly familiar. It is a variation of the science mission, the science lander that we sent to Minmus in order to save Hadfield. The capsule itself is just a regular Hydra 2 that I had simply loaded up inside the fairing. The lander is a little different. I will show the changes to that one in the VAB because of how much I changed on it. When I launched, I said this was using my new 5 meter parts, and you can see those there. I haven't really set this completely as a sub-assembly yet, but I will be getting to that fairly soon. And then we have our 5 meter fairing, where... Ooh, 
don't go away just yet. Let's take the front cover off there. You can see how, the, how I loaded in that Hydra 2 right on top of the lander itself. So we can take away the Hydra 2 because you've seen that one before and I didn't change anything about that. And then we can take away the fairing, which lets us zoom in nice and close on this new variant of the lander. So one of the things that you'll see is different is a lot of the science instruments have been removed. I have attached some extra Kerbal attachment system boxes on the sides where some of the science instruments used to be. I also have drop tanks for fuel on the sides right here. I'll get to that in a second, what that's all about. Down here, this is all very similar, except I modified the locations of these RCS jets in order to make sure that the thing was a little bit more balanced because it got a bit top heavy and there's big RCS jets up here. And so to balance that out, I needed some down way down as far away from the center of mass as I could possibly get. So in true Apollo style fashion, there is a decoupler right in there. That little black line you can see, that is a decoupler that will allow this top section to decouple from the bottom section right here. The top section is going to be powered by the RCS and these radial engines that are right here, as well as these drop tanks on the sides. So a quick scan from the bottom you can see we have the engine there with those RCS jets we have the water purifier for life support another life support system here here and here we have our fuel tanks and our landing gear as well as one of them I had a Kerbal attachment pipe attached to it just a little bit of mono propellant there and these little brackets are how I got those tanks to sit on the sides we have our Kerbal attachment system boxes on the sides and on the back right there. These are fuel tanks that will drop away. We have our communications right there. Radial engines on both sides here. Batteries on the sides of the top section so that it'll have plenty of power as well as actual solar panels up there. We have our ladder and our bottom service module section. Now this is the decoupler, which will then separate away, leaving this to maneuver its way back up to the lander so that Svetlana can come home. We'll have to refuel though, because there won't be enough fuel in the lander once we've actually gotten there and done the whole landing and everything like that. But that's okay because this is going to collect cathane anyway. So we got our RCS and all the sides here and we have these radial fuel tanks to supply all of those engines and RCS. There are some little solid boosters right here that will activate when we decouple. Our communications is there and there, shielded docking port, the capsule itself, and the avionics just in case I want to use this in an unmanned mode. And that brings us back to orbit where we were just about to dock up Svetlana's capsule with the lander. The playback is going at four times normal speed because it turned out for some reason that this Hydra was a little bit more unstable on its maneuvering than I remember them being in the past. Maybe I need to change the RCS jets that I'm using. Stop using the ones that kind of point diagonally and only in two directions at a time and using extra ones of them. Maybe I need to check the balance on it. Maybe the balance is actually not what I thought it was back when I first made it. Nonetheless, we have docked up just the same and now decoupled from that Mooner injection stage. It'll go flying up really high and then come back and go crashing through the atmosphere because the periapsis is still well inside Kerbin's lower atmosphere. We have flipped around so that we can continue the burn. Remember, we weren't quite there yet. I need to continue extending this orbit out until it intercepts the moon. Don't really have it set as a target. I'll have to pick that. All right, so we can see we're getting close and there's an intercept. Actually, that was a pretty quick intercept. Anyway, it looks like we're currently crashing into the moon's surface, but we'll be able to make an adjustment once we get there. However, that will be on the next episode of Project Odyssey because this one is over. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts. Thank you.